and she's a nurse in australia you guys know how much i advocate for mental health nothing over here so we want to eat the australian money na money as well asking her questions on healthcare assistance because we too want to relocate abby so what was your pay like i think it's about seventy thousand. dollars i was mad when i found it i was like what am i actually doing in Hey guys and welcome back to my channel. It's your one and only baby girl from Vicky. It's been ages since we had a conversation on health topics, okay? And I'm like, you guys, I've been stabbing you guys and thanks to Nos Dio for introducing me to this beautiful, gorgeous lady. My name is Tembi and she's a nurse in Australia. Not just a nurse, but a mental health nurse. And you guys know how much I advocate for mental health nothing over here so today she's going to be telling us everything giving us all the juices because we want to eat the australian money na money as well so she's going to be telling us everything about nursing in australia and i'm definitely going to be asking her questions on healthcare assistance because we too want to relocate abby so yeah welcome to the channel and please introduce yourself to us Hi, uh, my name is Tembi and uh, like Vicky said, I'm a registered nurse. I've been living in Australia for just over a year now. I moved here in April 2023 and before that I lived in New Zealand for 18 months and before that I was in England. So okay. I've traveled around a bit <laughs> and yeah, you know, I talk about travel, immigration and just general life um, as a nurse, you know that's good welcome to von vicky's channel okay thank you guys <laughs> if my energy is low please our time zone is different as you can see i'm supposed to be safe but we got to do this for you guys so a quick question how is it like working in australia generally versus the uk in general especially in general yeah yeah so in my experience Experience, uh, Australia versus the UK, the systems are quite similar, as in similar medications, similar ways of doing things, um, similar illnesses. So there hasn't really been like any major, like, oh my God, this is a new illness, or oh, this is a new medication I've never seen before. Um, so it is quite similar but then there are lots of differences um within the u because there are lots of differences within sort of how um like structurally for example so different states have got different healthcare boards and they all have different standards and they all have different paperwork and they all have different expectations of you as a nurse um so i've been finding that there are definite differences in that side like structurally um to the uk but when it comes to the actual patient care patient treatment illnesses that's very similar okay. um and then also we, we then go on to things like differences in pay and things like that um which i guess we can talk about later or later please yeah. <laughs> so a quick one you know in in the uk when it comes to mental health nursing the documentation is it, sometimes documentation can take 10 hours of your shifts compared to the actual treatment. Is it the same in Australia? In Australia, in the two different places I've worked, it's similar but different. Let me let me explain. In the first place where I worked, I was like, I was working in a place called Albury, New South Wales. It's a small, tiny little village, um, village town. And their paperwork was ridiculous. It was even more than the paperwork in the uk i would spend the entire shift doing paperwork they wanted paperwork upon paperwork upon paperwork where i currently am we do have like a, um, a good like digital system but there is the the paperwork is there but i would say it's not as much as before and it's not as much as the uk nope. so this is where like the structural thing comes in where each healthcare board will have their own standards uh for what they want so and australia is so big and there are so many states that there may be are places where the paperwork is just as much as england and there are places where it might not be as much okay. really so, and i've kind of had both you know but the paperwork you do have to do some 
Okay. So let's talk about the settings in um, mental health in Australia. Compared to the UK, we have the um in we sorry, we have the acute, we have the rehab, we have the forensic mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so forth and so on. Is it the same kind of settings you have over there in Australia as well? Yes, yes. We have similar structures. We have acute wards, we have open wards, closed wards, uh rehab yeah rehabs long-term rehabs forensic units community treatments community crisis units so yeah we yeah very very similarly structured yeah so when you say um, open ward and closed ward, what does that mean because that sounds new to me oh, okay so uh an uh, an open ward is where uh people who've been ad you know, admitted to hospital in the mental health unit but they can go in and out of the ward as they please so these are people that are not under the mental health act Okay. And then I think the closed ward would be for people who they need to, you know, keep there and they will need like leave approval forms in order to like go to the shops or whatever. That, that's the, yeah, that's the difference. I think that's the difference with the UK, sure. We call them uh -huh. informal patients and... Yeah. yeah. So yeah. We, there's a mixture of informal patients, of course, they admitted themselves into the hospital and they can go out when they please and when they when and yeah. come when they please so they are it's kind of a mixture of all kind of patients in an acute yeah. world so. yeah exactly uh but i think the difference is that uh where i am um there is a specific unit that they try and just keep all of the informal people okay. so that they can just go in and out it doesn't it's not a perfect science <laughs> what sometimes are you? It's a mixture yeah it's a good one for us to have here in the uk because sometimes when you have an informal patient on the ward it kind yeah. of rise up other patients whose leave hasn't been granted yet and they're like why is this why is it, why would this particular patient be going on leave whenever they want and i can't even get to go on leave so i think yeah. the way it's done in australia personally i think it's perfect at least everybody knows that we are informal and we can go out and come back yeah. with okay. yes yes yeah. see as much as but like I said, it doesn't always work that way, but you know, that's, that's the theory. <laughs> okay, no problem. So when it comes to patients and nursing ratio, what is it like in Australia? I'll give um, you an example. Sorry to call to you, for example. So on a day shift, which is a long day shift, it's usually two nurses and three HCAs. That's when we don't have high levels of observations, just when you go on a normal shift. So but on a night shift it's two nurses and two hcas on days you can't afford to get two nurses three hcas and one nurse again when you don't have high levels of reservation now the number of staffing now increases depending on the amount of um level of observations you have per shift so what is it like in australia yeah, so you know, it's, it's hard for me to speak about the inpatient side because mm -hmm. I I only worked in the community. Oh, okay. and to be yeah, yeah, so, and I currently work in the community, uh, so I can speak more to that side. But mm -hmm. I do have friends who work in the inpatient unit, and it's structured stru slightly different here, where they don't really have HCAs like within the mental health units. It's all it's either all our uh, registered nurses. <laughs> Or, <laughs> yeah, you get yeah you, you get care assistance in aged care yeah. and in um we have like support workers like you know uh, they call it ndis here like you know those people that need that live at home and they need someone yeah. to take them to shops mm -hmm. like disability support workers but um in terms of the inpatient unit it's either registered nurses or enrolled nurses which i think are the equivalent of like band fours you know those ones like good men <laughs> no hope for me <laughs> what yeah it's rn or en or um and then i guess the equivalent will probably be a ward aide and but a ward aide is the person who's like you know cleans the ward mm -hmm. brings the meals but it's not the same role no Ooh. it really isn't um and uh, i've done when it comes to um like the ratios i have done a couple of shifts in the older person's unit here mm -hmm. um older person's mental health sort of dementia unit so i can speak to their staffing ratios mm -hmm. so what they had was um i think up to 10 residents on a ward mm -hmm. and they would have one 
either two RNs and one EN or one RN and two ENs um, and then they would have a ward aide who is the person that's you know doing all of the extra things and if someone is like on one-to-one -one observations or they need some extra observations then they can get um either like an extra nurse or someone who uh, they call them a sitter um just to sit with that person but that was the sort of ratio it's like it was almost like three three or four nurses yeah. to one um yeah but i do have friends who do work in the inpatient unit so i can get a bit more information from them mm. and like send it to you um you know and get like a little bit more accurate numbers i feel heartbroken because in the uk i think on most shifts to be fair when, when it comes to the paperwork we give it to the nurses but every yeah. other thing that has to do with the service user being on the world is the hcs that practically yeah. takes care of it and it yeah. makes a little bit easier on the nurses to focus on other things that needs to be done say medication say paperwork then adls and um every other thing that has to do with the service user has to do with the hcs i want how how are you nurses coping over that brings me how many hours yeah, yeah. well that that's why they have more rns on the shift okay yeah but in terms of the exact the exact ratios i would need to like talk to my friends and ask uh okay. but i do have a friend who works in uh the it's called pq hdu okay. and on the night shift um i think hdu's got over here has got the capacity i think they've got about six to eight patients and uh, they have three RNs on a mm -hmm. night shift. Um, and if there are any sort of extra people, then they get security, like actual <laughs> the hospital security mm -hmm. guards to be the ones that will sit with the people, mm -hmm. um, to sit with the patients um, if there's any sort of ex security risk. So it works slightly different here as in um, like he healthcare assistance, certainly in the me in mental health unit, it doesn't know. So for healthcare assistants that would want to relocate to Australia for whatever reason, you it's better to focus your attention on aged care instead. Yeah, aged care. Yeah, aged care. and I'll have to say it's the same in the community because I remember when I was working in the community in England, we mm -hmm. also had healthcare assistants who would go out on visits with us, mm -hmm. who would, um, yeah, kind of be like you know that support, be the second person for the nurse, etc. But uh, ever since I got here, like there are no healthcare assistants, even in the community, it's all registered nurses or enrolled nurses. And mm -hmm. enrolled nurses are the people that they have to work under the supervision of a registered nurse. There are some things that they can't do, but there are lots of things that they can. Yeah, so they don't, they don't do- That's anything. the same, yeah. I think with, um, with um, the UK, when it comes to enrolled nurses, we call them registered, um, not associates that's the word i was looking for yes yes <laughs> so i think they currently do everything the nurses do apart from cd medications yeah so it's yeah. more like okay when you have a nurse associate on shifts that has gotten their pin of course you yeah. just do everything apart from cd medications then when you become a a band five which is a pre-registered nurse you can now start doing the cd medications in that yeah. case Oh. Girl, do you know what? Get get married and come as a partner. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Or better still. Oh, do you already? My... <laughs> no worries. Let me go at heart. <laughs> so let's talk about the main thing. Oh, ego money. Let's talk about that. But before we talk about money, Let's talk about, um, I know I asked you something about annual leave. You know, in the UK, we pride ourselves with good annual leave, you know, holiday flowing here and there. And while you're at it, you're getting paid. And when you are sick, because this will cover sickness and annual leave before we get into the money part. When you are sick, genuinely, genuinely sick, or you are hit by a patient and you have industrial sickness, you know, yeah. you still get paid. How is it like over there in Australia? Yeah, so a lot of the similar things, if you're sick, if, you, if you're permanent, um, mm -hmm. of course. That's the word, permanent. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> your permanent use it but the sick leave works very differently here whereas I remember in the nhs you get given like your 30 days at the start of the calendar year mm-hmm. um or however many days you get given but over here you start off on zero and then you accumulate your leave so oh. uh, yeah so how it works is that i think you get like i don't know i want to say six to eight hours per pay cycle and you get paid every two weeks so you build up and you build up and you build up your hours Mm. the bad thing is in the beginning you start off with no leave the good thing is there is no limit to how much leave you can have oh okay in the end yeah especially if you're not using it so literally and it was the same case in new zealand as well where you accrue your leave per pay cycle uh and in new zealand i think it was like eight hours every two weeks that was so eight hours is a day yeah is a, is a working day so you accrue an eight uh, every working day every two weeks so if you work what six months straight i don't know how many hours i don't know what the math is um so there's pros and cons of course i think i'll go with the uk as well but no, I, I think I'd go with this one. Do you know why? Because literally I knew people back in New Zealand who had like up to like 2000 hours of annual leave who've been there for ages, who just keep accruing, accruing, accruing. Whereas so it's the Asia, choice of whether to go for the annual leave or just keep accruing your annual leave hours. Yeah. And you can take your leave if you want. Um, and whereas in the UK you have your 30 days and then they have to, they make you take it because in some, in some organizations. Before the next financial year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You can't take it for the next financial year. Whereas Except over here. certain circumstances and who your manager is, they may be able to push it for you. Exactly. Yeah. So you're forced to use it. But if you're thinking, yeah. So I know in the short term, it's, it's, it's kind of a bit tricky, but I think in the long run, um, you can go and leave for like six months and be paid happily. Um, <laughs> yeah. And that's the same for sick leave as well. So for sick leave, uh, I remember in New Zealand, we were, we were given like 10 days per year of sick leave back in New Zealand. And um, what you do is you can either combine that with your whatever annual leave if you're sick. But then mm-hmm. there's also... Um, over here there's things like center link which is equivalent for getting like your benefits so if you like have to be off long term for whatever reason you can still like you know claim benefits if it's it was like an industrial work accident then your employer would be you know paying you um you know whilst you're off so you do get like some protections but yeah that the annual leave is very different okay but i'm agency i don't get any annual leave sorry i'm so sorry <laughs> Because I remember bank staff, whenever they come, they'll be like, oh God, you permanent staff. Because especially if someone comes on the ward and they are injured, sometimes they don't take it too well because they're like, I'm not covered. Who's going to cover me? Yeah. But bank actually kind of give them a stipend, but it's not going to be the same as, I could be off six months out of industrial sickness and I get paid my full salary for the yes. whole six months compared to someone that is in like an agency or a bank shift. So yeah it's the same here because they they we get paid more mm-hmm. and with casual staff yeah they get paid more anyway to account yeah okay. okay so let's talk about your hours we do 13 hours here of course which Oof. sometimes can be daunting you know we have yeah. the early shifts we have the long days we have the late we have the twilight and we have the night shift but most times you find yourself doing the long days or the nights, except on rare occasions where you need to make up your hours or maybe you have like health issues or you've discussed with your manager about child care and they can be able to work out something for you. So, but generally, let's just say we have the yeah. long days and the nights. So how are your hours? And that's going to mm-hmm. lead us to the money. Okay. Yeah. So what kind so- of hours do you do? Yeah, so at the moment I'm doing community, um, so it's what, 8.30 until 5 o'clock, which is <laughs> what, eight. seven and a half, eight hours yeah. with, a, with a one hour break. Oh. <laughs> Imagine. Oh. So this is just community. Um, oh. On the ward, they do, they have two different shifts. They've got the, um, 
seven thirty until like I want to say four four thirty. That's like eight hours, and then the afternoon is like two two thirty until ten, and then the night shift is ten until seven thirty. So most of the time, people do five days a week worth time five days a week times eight and a half hours. Um, mm. And um, yeah, so it's normally two shifts, two shifts that you do. But you can do long days if they're short staffed. You can stay extra, and then you'd be paid as overtime. So that's definitely an option. And if you then do just decide to do a long day, you'd be doing a fourteen-hour shift. <laughs> you know, but uh, the shift patterns are very standard. They do yeah, like eight hours lots. And that was the biggest surprise when I moved to New Zealand as well. That it was all like half days or well, half days like eight hour shifts so i'd work i'd go into work five days a week instead of the three long days yeah, yeah I, I think the five days because if i want to go to work five days a week i think it should be my choice because i'm used to looking at my rota and i'm like okay i'm working monday wednesday and friday and i'm like okay these mm -hmm. are my regular shifts if i decide that i want to work monday to sunday it should now be my choice to pick up extra bank shift but the hour no, you know after i've done it this way I, you know what when i did the, uh, when i did the the shifts in the older person's unit they are uh, they do it 12 hours like yeah. 7 a.m until 12. i couldn't i couldn't function <laughs> but the the first, i was like yo <laughs> but if you work five hour five days a week what time do you use to get extra shift that means you find yourself working like seven days a week if you want to do extra not, shit not necessarily you can do maybe one day where you do the long days but then it, it just depends on what your life is you know if you're doing a morning shift you know you'll be finished by three four o'clock in the afternoon mm -hmm. and you've got the rest of your day if you're starting an afternoon shift you know you're starting at two o'clock in the afternoon so you've had your whole morning um it just depends on what your life balance and is but because but i was finding that i was having more time to do things because i was finding that when i did lo the long days yeah my entire day is gone mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and on my off days all i wanted to do was sleep sleep true it or clean my house mm -hmm. and then i'm back to work the next day and then i'm like oh i've got a day off tomorrow but then i've got 14 hours the next day i i was finding that with the long days anyway I, I just wasn't having getting that balance whereas yeah. the half days yeah you go in more times but then it's only half a day that you're doing and if you want to pick an extra shift you can pick an extra shift you know um you can choose to do two or three long days and then maybe the next day you sort of um you know relax a bit more yeah it pros and cons to each <laughs> <laughs> kind true, of. true true i agree so what what's your pay like is it per hour or you yeah so you? you get paid hourly um oh, no, no, not hourly well i get paid hourly because because i'm a i'm a agency nurse so my mind is hourly but for other people they have their baseline pay and then um then they get paid extra like time and a half or time and a quarter if it's weekends or nights or late shifts mm -hmm. if that makes sense yeah so it's okay. very similar to the uk and then obviously you get paid more if, if it's a public holiday etc yeah so for a nurse that's just starting what what would be like an average salary the person is expecting in australian dollars so it's not a very straightforward answer because it depends on which state you are in no <laughs> different yeah different states in australia pay very differently the highest paying state in australia is brisbane if you want to be making your good money no not brisbane queensland that's where they've got really good <laughs> yeah that, they've really really good incentives for nurses really oh. really good the lowest paying one is where i currently am tasmania why are you not going to queensland sister well i'm agency so it doesn't make a difference for now but you know when i when i decide to get a permanent job all right i will be looking elsewhere please, and, please. yeah let me just google the average starting salary i think it's about seventy thousand dollars but i do want to be um i do want to be uh, sort of roughly accurate 
uh, yeah yeah I was kind of right so on average an entry level nurse sort of if you're starting off kind of at the bottom of the food chain you're mm-hmm. coming in you'll be earning about roughly between 70 to 75 thousand Australian dollars per year which and that's is much- Australian dollars is about 38 thousand pounds okay yeah yeah that's a band that's starting six. like band five that's a band six in england yeah, going yeah. to scotland that's a band five i recently found that, that scotland pays better than england pro tip for those of no. you i swear <laughs> i recently found that, that scotland the money that a a band five ends in england that's what a band three i think ends in scotland I was mad when I found it. I was like, what am I actually doing in England? I'll switch to Scotland, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. So it's about, so that's the starting, but the average nurse earns, um, like on average, sort of basic, um, they earn about 87, 88,000 per year mm-hmm. base salary, uh, which is, let me, which is about 46,000 pounds um and when i was in the in new zealand i remember i started off on like 70 and then they had like some big pay rise thing and then um i i kind of went up in the scale and at the end in new zealand i was my base salary was ninety nine thousand new zealand dollars per year just just the base without any weekends nights whatever yeah what? yes <laughs> what yes <laughs> just your basic salary just without any my basic salary yeah basic salary and now that i've been qualified if I, i've been qualified for what seven years now so if i was to go back into being a permanent uh that's roughly what i will be looking to make something about 95 96 thousand dollars um base <laughs> okay that's good so in a month what's can one get an as an average salary yes yeah, so, so over here uh the pay cycle is every two weeks they don't mm-hmm. do we don't do monthly okay things. that's good yeah. yeah it's every two weeks so if you're earning about let's go on the higher end of that like ninety thousand, roughly you'll be earning about three thousand three hundred dollars per fortnight Okay. which is um about six and a half six and a half per month yeah six and a half per month which is about three thousand pounds per month roughly not if bad we, yeah yeah but then again it all depends are you doing extras are you doing nights are you doing weekends mm-hmm. um but yeah that would be roughly no less than three thousand dollars per fortnight okay so compared to what you make because i know here in england when you make when you get like your basic salary it depends on your lifestyle sometimes it's enough other times you get to struggle if you don't do extra shifts now compared to what you make and cost of living and if our lifestyle spending sorting out bills in general without extra shifts are you going to really struggle are you going to have savings or you just pay and still have good savings again this is lifestyle dependent but for me personally i i've always been someone who's very frugal i'm i'm a budgeter if you look through my old videos it was all about finance counting yeah. everything so for me personally i've always found that i've been able to have extra money i've been able to save i've been able to help out family at home and still have that surplus extra but it is lifestyle dependent because whether you're in england whether you're here where you choose to live number one is going to be um a big one how many kids you have how, how what are you spending what are your bills do you have credit cards do you have your cars do you have car loans do you have that that the lifestyle is it's still going to be um yeah even though you do get more money you could end up be you know, just spending more anyway kind of thing so i think it is all lifestyle dependent but i do feel that in australia you do have a lot more flexibility you have a lot more wiggle room whereas i feel like in england the pay is so tight that you it's you don't have 
Oh god, Jesus. Actually, you, you really can't move. Mm -mm. You really, really can't. Whereas here, I feel like you can get, you do have a little bit more wiggle room, but as long as you're sensible, you, you mm -hmm. should be, you should be fine. Okay. So a quick question. You, you said something about you, you are, um, you just do agencies. Yeah. So yeah. A, first of all, when it comes to application of job, say I don't have like an Australian passport when it comes to like job and getting, because in the UK, I can't be agency like that if I don't have like a job keeping me here or I don't have the British passport. I don't know if I'm making sense. So what kind of visa are you working on? How are you doing the agency? How is it here in the country? What visa are you using? I don't know. Yeah. Can you just explain how yeah. it's working out for you? And we talked yeah. about how the British passports, how, how does it help the person as well? yeah so no matter what your passport is you still you need to have a visa that gives you working rights and not every visa allows you to do that so if you come here as a visitor you, you can't work you mm -hmm. know um so i came with a working holiday visa so that's the visa that they give to like under 35s so they can come here and uh work for a live and work and travel for a year and they can still work so that was the australian government gives if you're under 35 yeah it's for like young people like um like you know those backpackers who come in they do farm work it allows you to work so that was the original visa that i came with it was a working oh. holiday it was only a one-year visa mm -hmm. um because I, I was planning on just traveling <laughs> and just doing agency so i can just get some money um originally anyway and then i decided that i want to stay in australia longer and that working holiday you have to renew it or you can only renew it twice but it's like maximum three years like um and you can't you know have uh, all of the working all of the other rights of australians etc so I then chose to get a permanent um, residency visa. So the visa that I currently have is the 189 permanent residency visa. You can get this one onshore or offshore. And the criteria to get it is that you must be under 45. You must have a skill or an occupation that's on the skills list. And they, they, this list changes all the time. Um, and then there are other things you have to do as well. But um, that's how you, you, that's mainly the route. And then you're granted permanent residency. You stay here indefinitely. Um, you can, I can now buy a house. I can now, <laughs> you know, I've, just, I've got all of the rights of like an Australian citizen almost. And then after five years, I can apply for, for citizenship. So, so after that five I'm, years. Yeah. So compared to the UK, there's really no difference. The only thing is, I'll stay five years under a work visa, but I'm not entitled to. But I'm not entitled to benefits. I can buy a mortgage if I want to. But oh, I, okay. oh yeah, I've got benefit. Yeah, I can get benefits. So their yeah. benefit system is called Centrelink. So I I now have access to all of that essentially. Whereas on the working holiday visa, I didn't. You know, <laughs> I I could only what work really and travel um and then it would expire but i think australia does have is more is kinder in terms of the fact that like you can get permanent residency straight away even mm -hmm. before you yeah. arrive yeah. you know and i think as long as you've got a skill that's on the skills list if you're in healthcare you're all you're pretty much guaranteed to have permanent residency and there are different types of permanent residency as well this is just the one i went through Oh, I see. So is, you mustn't necessarily need an employer to give you a job before you can apply for a visa. Yeah. So that's also, that's another type of visa. That's an employer sponsored, um, visa as well. That I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to do that particular visa cause that's the visa I had in New Zealand mm -hmm. and I didn't like being tied down to an employer and being on like a work visa yeah. so the, this one that i chose was a completely independent um so i can i'm not attached to anyone i had to pay for everything myself you know i'm not entirely attached to anyone but there are employer visas um where they employ you and then they sponsor you and then you have to work for them for a certain amount of time or if you leave you have to pay them back the visa money but um you can also get permanent residency through through that way and in fact one of my colleagues um 
um, from Birmingham. She came here in November and she did the employer sponsored visa where they sponsored her, paid for her flight, yeah. her accommodation, etc. Okay, that's good. So I'll ask you two more questions so that I'll let you start your beautiful Sunday morning, okay? So the last, uh, second to the last question has to do with career path in terms of HCAs, nurses and doctors. For HCAs in the UK, you know about the Nursing Associate Program and every yeah. other program that you want to do. Just, let's just say the apprenticeship programs. When I see you want to be a nurse, a psychologist, whatever mm -hmm. it is you really want to do there are those programs and for you to grow or you can go back to uni or whatever it is and for nurses you know the bands grow for doctors yeah. as well you write your exams anyways let's not measure on doctors that's their personal problem let's talk about hcas and nurses so what's like what's the growth in australia like yeah there is definitely potential to grow and move up the ladder like structurally it's similar to the nhs as in you know you get your different levels of managers and regional managers and directors and um i don't know what do you call them like ward man like all of that so there is definitely there are opportunities to grow and to move up the ladder and there are also you know opportunities to go back to university and get like um like you know extra training to do all of that stuff like over here their nurses because the, all of their nurses they do general nursing general training and then they specialize afterwards and they have to do like an extra like graduate certificate for them to be called like mental health nurses or yeah. whatever so there is uh you know opportunities for, for that so there's always opportunities for growth and like i said they use more ens enrolled nurses here so there are opportunities for if you're a carer for you to go to school i think it's like two years to get your enrolled nursing which is like your nursing associate and then from there, huh you get sponsored to go to uni or you do it yourself i'm not sure about that one i think your employer can sponsor you but i i'm not too sure about um that because i haven't had an experience with that so um, yeah i'm really not sure yeah in terms of how that would yeah how that would be okay that's good so in general as you said earlier someone trying to come at a healthcare assistant should just focus the attention mostly on aged care yeah yes yeah because that, that's where the care assistants are used more yeah essentially. yeah so, so it's a bit tricky so what if i'm already a nurse associate in the uk what, does that give me room to be able to get something in mental health yeah if you're a nurse associate then you you're the equivalent of an enrolled nurse it's the same thing essentially so yeah you can yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah as long as you, you've got your registered you've got your pin um yeah you can okay so the final question i have to ask you has to do with um bringing your partner or coming mm -hmm. with your partner so mm -hmm. let's say i'm coming with my partner for example and mm -hmm. i what kind of pathways in terms of getting jobs in the uk partners some dependents sometimes are they kind of find it difficult to get the kind of jobs they want not like they don't get it but they kind of find it difficult especially yeah. because the uk will tell you or you need to go back and study we need certifications on these we need experiences on these what is it like for dependents over there when to get like jobs generally is it easy do you have to do the certifications and or you can use whatever experience you have to work yeah i think you can definitely use whatever experience you have to apply and look around for jobs but um without sort of certifications you're gonna find it really hard and or you're probably gonna be limited to sort of lower paid jobs that's just the um unfortunate reality for partners that uh, unless you've kind of got that skill or that certificate it'll be pretty tricky for you mm. to do uh, but in terms of getting jobs as like a carer or working as like a support worker, those things don't take much, you know, um, you definitely can. There are certainly places that are always hiring. They're always talking about they're in shortages. <laughs> so that, you, that definitely can happen, but it is trickier for the partner, especially if they don't have like, um, like a qualification. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
then um i know for no i know when it comes to migration for nurses qualified nurses is usually easy i don't know if you know anyone that has come to um australia with the health care with the hca routes like the healthcare assistant routes do you know anyone that has been successful in doing that no no not that i know like almost everyone i know are oh, it's like registered uh, nurses <laughs> yeah because i wanted to ask whether it's as easy as i would say the one in uk is easy once you made the point base in uk it's easy for you to come yeah. in as a healthcare assistant but i wanted to know are they really collect because i've seen most news where they say there's shortage of health um, support workers mm-hmm. healthcare assistants and mm-hmm. nurses especially so are they really 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 collecting healthcare assistants from other countries or they're just focusing their search on nurses yeah i think they're focusing on, on nurses i think the best um the best place to look at would be the australian immigration skills list that that they want and like i said that list changes i feel like it changes almost every week it's gonna change it's gonna change again in um on the first of july because that's the new financial year that's when all of the the, the new rules the new immigration rules start to come in though literally it changes all the time so i'll just be keeping an eye on that list because sometimes some professions are there and then sometimes some professions get taken off yeah. um so they, i think they just do an evaluation of what they need as a country <laughs> and then they just make those decisions so finally your lifestyle you're living in australia new zealand and uk which do you prefer and why yeah. Just sell, sell yourself or sell the country to us. No, <laughs> no, I prefer the Australia, the Australian and New Zealand lifestyle compared to the UK um, for a number of reasons. I think financially it's because, you know, proportionally speaking, you get paid more. Mm-hmm. So you do have, you know, the resources and the financial uh, resources to be able to do other things um mm-hmm. with your life i feel like i have more time because i'm doing half shifts i'm only working like eight hours a day even mm-hmm. though it's five days a week i feel like i've got more uh time in the mornings the afternoons at weekends um to just do simple things like go to the shops <laughs> go to the beach um yeah, yeah sleep <laughs> Very important. I feel like more, yeah i feel like i've got more time to do that um and yeah it just feels because it's a new environment obviously there are difficulties that come with you know being in a new place yeah. not as many black people etc oh. but i think because i just feel like in england i just feel like there's like constant pressure you know mm-hmm. it just feels so busy on the go all the time whereas i feel like here like that pressure cooker isn't there as much um yeah so i i I definitely do prefer the lifestyle here i feel like i've got a better work-life balance i feel like i've got more things to do yeah Um, and i feel like i've got more opportunities to do things down here oh that's nice work-life is very important and i think it's something we lack in the uk because as you said when you do a 13 hour shift you come back and you're knackered all you want to do is sleep and there are days that i do like an early shift and i come home and i see the difference i see what i can do i can go to the gym i can cook i can eat yeah i I, I, I feel you sis i feel you yeah (laughs) and when if you want to do a long day to get um extra money you then plan that out because everything is is fortnightly anyway so you can be like okay let me do one long day per fortnight because that will make a big difference you know Mm -hmm uh or one long day a week and that's that should be optional not mandatory i feel um i just um picked out something in something you said about um not lots of black people in terms of racism i i did a lot of do you feel like people are being racist towards you or you just feel like it's it's just normal yeah i ha- to be fair the whole time the last three years in australia and new zealand i've often been the only black person mm. either at work, in the room maybe it's the places i'm picking i don't know like just feel like I've so been how, the you, only... how have you been feeling with that or how do you feel no, with that 
Um, obviously, you know, you feel like you stand out, uh, mm -hmm. which you do. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like I haven't experienced any like racism, like obvious racism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would say any questions about where I'm from have genuinely been from a place of curiosity. Yeah. Because believe it or not, I've met people who've never met a black person in their life or a person mm -hmm. from Zimbabwe. And they're like, they're just like fascinated and they're more like, curious as, as to actually just wanting to know you because you they just don't see many of you many people that look like you around so it's a, so it's a different kind of level from what i've experienced in the uk where they're like oh my god where are you from like you know as in like go back to your own country whereas over here in new zealand it's been more like oh where are you from like i've never met anyone from zimbabwe tell me about that like oh my god you guys braid your hair like well, what, how does that work like, they genuinely want to know like, genuinely curious <laughs> so that's the difference that i found um i feel like no matter where you are in in life you're gonna have racism you get there are gonna be people who are just not gonna like you you're whatever okay. but i haven't i would say i haven't felt like I've, I haven't experienced any discrimination that I know of anyway. Maybe they're good at hiding it, but I certainly don't feel like I've experienced any of that, like in the shops, in the streets, anything like that. No. Yeah. And everything has been from like a place of curiosity. Okay. Anyways, yeah. guys, thank you so much, Tembi. Thank you for granting me this interview. Thank you because you're officially my first guest for the year. <laughs> so what thank you I guys so much if you have any more questions just leave it in the comment section below and we don't mind doing it do you mind doing a part two i don't mind doing a part two i can go and like talk to my friends and get more details about uh the nursing ratios and everything like that so yeah oh, absolutely all right so we don't mind doing a part two just leave your comments in the comment whatever your question is you got can be here to answer those questions so yeah. thank you guys so much and please do go to our channel to see more most most things about relocation immigration australia moving as a nurse and every other pathway that you need to find out how to move and how to make this money because you guys know that i'm team australia anytime any day so yeah thank you so much okay Gents, <laughs> was there anything you would like to say no no not really i think we covered quite a lot of things so thank you yeah. thank you and i'm hoping to see you soon okay and i'll soon <laughs> be in australia fingers crossed <laughs> <Amen>. <laughs> thank you so much